First and foremost, I want to join my voice with others to wish the Executive Governor happy birthday. The other side of it is the business we are here for. And if in the first paper, the lecturer talked about deepening and enlightening and simplifying the notable challenges in Nigeria in a globalized era. And he gave us German, the number of German companies and what they are here for. First and foremost, if we take it holistically, using the second and the third paper together, Nigeria has one of the, is the biggest black population in the world as a country. And because of the size of its population, which is a potential for it, there's a lot of interest in the Nigerian nation. If you read some of the documents that are even been circulated before now, for us in River State, our coastline here down to Congo is known as the next Saudi Arabia. And it is expected that between this basin down to the Congolese and the Gabonese basin, Nigeria will be supplying 25% of the energy needs of the world. And that is the next focus of the international community. It is also stated that we have the 20th strongest economy in the world. However, the question is, have we as a people known these potentials, known these statistics, invested in the future in such a manner that we capture the very essence of the new wealth that is to come upon us? And one of the areas the various leaders, lecturers have talked about is about our young and vibrant upcoming youth. If you look at it today, our HR index, that's our human resource index, is very low. The, we have a lot of graduates in the streets without skills, a lot of graduates in the streets without IT knowledge, and it therefore becomes necessary that at this point in time, we must review our educational ideology and focus on an educational philosophy that is productive rather than consuming. First and foremost, we must begin to look at an educational system that will create jobs rather than look for employment. In that wise, skill acquisition and bringing our youth up in IT engineering and technology will be key to the future. The other aspect that we should also look about in deepening our democracy is the issue of partnership. But then you cannot go into partnership in an environment where your partner knows it all and you know nothing. And so it is necessary for government at all levels, local government, state, federal levels, to begin to invest in industry, invest in education and infrastructure with a view to giving our youth and the future generation the kind of capacity and skill they need so that they can constructively engage our foreign partners when they come to form these partnerships. But then one of the questions I keep asking as somebody who has been involved in the struggle the emancipation of the Niger Delta. It's the fact that most times people mistake infrastructural development as human development. Infrastructure is key, yes, but human capacity development is the biggest key. When we begin to develop our human capacity to be productive, they will produce the right infrastructural development. And therefore, the total dependence on all, only infrastructure does not make. The other thing is growing the middle class. How do you grow the middle class when you do not have industries? How do you grow the middle class when you don't have companies that will bring about resources, be productive in such a manner that you have a wage structure that is benefiting 
How do you grow the middle class when everybody depends on government for employment? And the only place people don't want to get employed in is in teaching. Now, everybody wants to be involved, but nobody wants to talk about the mechanism. The middle class must come from a purposeful investment by government in industry and commerce. And it is only when they support the middle class that that can come up. Two things stand out, especially in River State. If you meet somebody on the street, he or she will tell you that she is looking for a political appointment, or she, he or she wants to work in Shell or Ajip. And if you tell them that all the jobs in Ajip are now mechanized and the technical aspect has taken over the job, they get disappointed. And everybody wants to be in government, and if the governor does not give everybody the employment, he or she is a bad person. And so the only way to redistribute wage income and reduce poverty is to invest in structures and industry that will create employment and people themselves should be productive and creative. Now, when you look at the new structure of the emerging economy, I, as far as I'm concerned, I've always looked at it this way, that the Nigerian economy and structural and wage earning system is fractured and dislocated. A system where a National Assembly member earns 5 to 20 million naira a month, and then the lower earner is uh, 5,000 naira or 10,000 naira. Or if you go down to Umola Road, where you have these one-man businesses, graduates are earning 10 or 15,000. Will there be peace in such an environment? If you want to do something, the people, it's like the way I say it, even in the churches, the overseer must dress according to the capacity of his, the economic capacity of his church. When our National Assembly members are earning salaries that are way out of this world, and you are telling the average member of the masses to begin to be patriotic, like a lot of me, they will refuse to be. So as far as I'm concerned, there's a major dislocation there. Now, if you look at even what's going, everybody's saying corruption, corruption, corruption. What is corruption? Corruption is the Boko Haram in all of us. Corruption is, we are blaming the Boko Haram in the north. But most, most of us in this place are Boko Haramites. In the sense that our mentality to the average person is different. And that is why Nigerians must think Nigeria, love Nigeria, and begin to work for Nigeria. As for the issue of terrorism, we all know, and it is a national duty. Everybody must know that security is not a government alone business. Security is for every Nigerian. If Nigeria fails, all of us in this room have no place to go to. Okay. If Nigeria fails, all of us in this room do not have any other thing to do. And then you become a beggar in another man's land. That is why you must make your nation better. That is why we must all support government to make sure that our environment is peaceful and report okay. everybody, anybody we see that is doing suspicious things. And okay. then if you look at it again, if it fails, yeah, Nigeria, is. sorry, one minute. Yeah, if it fails, Nigeria is an ECOWAS big player. Nigeria is an African big player. Round up. Nigeria is also a global big player. And therefore, if Nigeria fails, it has consequences not only on Nigeria, but on the African and the global community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're hearing the voices of activists today. And um, I'd like to shift the attention to distinguished Senator Magnus Abe. Well, first, let me thank the speakers for a very, very sound presentation that has highlighted our challenges and our potentials. But before I go into that, Your Excellency, let me congratulate you on this very, very wonderful edifice. I was one of those who, I was actually skeptical that we would not be able to gather here in May. And I want to publicly apologize that like everything else you say you must achieve, you have also achieved this one, and in May we are gathered in this hall. Congratulations. The first paper talked about the high potentials of our country. It highlighted the importance of education in the quest for development of our country. And it also talked about corruption as not being merely a Nigerian issue, but a 
global issue.